This is a class, but it's also a data type, but it's also an object, but it's also a constructor function. What the actual hell? I think it's best we start from the beginning, shall we? Classes, objects, and constructors are closely related to each other, so much so that you cannot understand one without the other. However, unfortunately, unlike other paradigms, object-oriented programming has a steeper learning curve, primarily because you have to understand these three concepts along with the static keyword all at the same time when starting your object-oriented journey. And it doesn't help that immediately after learning those concepts, you start learning about encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism without even building a basic application that utilizes a few classes and methods. So, in order to fully understand OOP, you must understand these four core concepts, and the rest you should learn when you're ready as you go along. In this video, I'll focus on the first three concepts, and in a future episode, I'll talk about the static keyword. So with that said, I'll assume for this video that you have a basic understanding of programming, presumably from another language, and let's get started with the object. Now, an object is nothing more than a collection of variables and functions bundled together. Now, for the sake of our example, we're just going to think of them as variables bundled together and not functions. Just throw away the functions, we don't want them. Now, we might have variables bundled together to represent a more complex piece of data. For example, Facebook posts. Each post has its own content, its own likes, its own comments, etc. And these values or variables are related to the post itself, so therefore each post would be its own object. In dynamically typed programming languages like JavaScript, you can simply declare an object by creating a variable and then assigning it to an object. Notice inside of the curly brackets we have keys and values. Well, these keys and values are actually the variables inside of the object. We typically refer to these variables as properties. So from here on out, whenever I say property, I mean a variable inside of the object. Now, JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. However, C Sharp and Java are not. And one does not simply declare an object inside of a statically typed language for the same reason you cannot declare a typeless variable. So in other words, we need to define the structure of the object before creating it. Enter the class. Now, a class is nothing more than the structure of how an object should look like. So, in order to create a class, we simply type in class, followed by the name of the class, and then inside of the curly brackets, we type the properties that should exist inside of the object. Notice how I wrote public on the property names? Yeah, completely ignore that for now. Now, I want you to stop and ponder here for a moment, and ask yourself, why did I declare the class above the program class and not to declare it inside of the main function? And the reason I'm asking you this is because I want you to think of classes in a certain way. So let's for a moment shift gears and talk about primitive data types. We all know what an integer is, and I can simply say int x is equal to 5. But nowhere in my code I have declared that an integer exists. It exists as part of the programming language. However, the one who invented the programming language has declared what an integer is. An integer is a 4-byte block of memory, and the data inside of it should be treated as a numeral without any decimal points. Classes are exactly the same, and just like the guy who invented the programming language declared what each data type is, we now have the power to create our own data types. So in other words, and from here on out, I want you to think of classes as complex data types. Now you might be thinking to yourself, no, no, there's no way, I refuse to believe that. Well, here's a list. Now because we've just created a post class, it's safe to assume that we want to instantiate an object of this class. So. I'll create a variable called post with a lowercase p, and it's going to be of type post. Now here's the confusing part. This is just a variable called post, and in order for us to assign it to an object, we must set it equal to new post. And this post refers to the constructor function. I'll explain what the constructor function is in a moment, but I'll just create another variable called post2 and not set it equal to anything. Now, if I turn on the debugger and check the value of post1, I would find that there are properties inside of it, and those properties are the exact same as the ones that are located in the class. However, if I check the value of post2, I would find that it is equal to null. And that is the differences that I want to talk about. There is a difference between a variable where its value is null and an object that has properties, and those properties have values of null. They are not the same thing. So the question now becomes, what exactly is this constructor function, where did it come from, and what exactly is it doing? Now, whenever we create a class, we automatically get with it a constructor function. We just don't need to explicitly type it, but it is there under the hood. But I can type it. If I decide to create a function inside of my class with the exact same name as the class, 
that class would automatically be the constructor function. And the whole purpose of this constructor function is actually two things. The first and main purpose of this function is to instantiate the object. So an object will not be able to exist without calling this constructor function with the new keyword. So in a sense, you can think of a constructor function as a regular function that just has a return value of the object itself. That's not exactly what's happening. I will make a video about what exactly happens when we call new. But for now, yes, that's exactly what a constructor function does. It returns an object. Now, the second thing that it does is it allows you to set default values to your properties or maybe implement any kind of logic that you want whenever you are creating an object. So for example, I could pass arguments to this constructor function and then set those arguments equal to the properties that exist with inside of my object. And that way I can have different objects with different initial values. Speaking of initial values, whenever we create a class and then we set it equal to a particular value, that value would only be the default value. And in order to change these values or even access them, we would simply use dot notation and just set it equal to whatever else we want to set it to. Now, one way I prefer to create objects in C Sharp is by using curly brackets. So I can simply just specify what I want the initial values to be whenever I create an object simply by using these curly brackets. Now, there are two important notes that I would like to mention before ending this video. The first has to do with this public keyword that I completely ignored. Public means these properties can be accessed from anywhere outside of the class, whereas private means you cannot access it from outside the class. So just keep them public if you run into some weird issues. Now, you might be thinking, well, why wouldn't I want to be able to access a property from outside the class? Like, isn't that the whole point? Which brings us to the second point that I would like to mention. I've mentioned in the beginning of the video that an object is a collection of variables and functions. Those variables are referred to as properties and the functions are actually referred to as methods. Now we can actually create functions inside of classes and treat them as regular functions in JavaScript, but we can also do other interesting things as well. For example, I have a post class right over here and I would like to add the like functionality. Now this like functionality presumably should be able to accept the ID of the person who clicked the like button on this particular post. So it will accept the ID of the person who liked it and it should add that ID into the list of like IDs. Now again, you might think, well, why can I not just simply add it? Well, you can, but that really depends on your functionality. There is an algorithm that you may want to run before clicking the like button. For example, once you click the like button, it checks if that ID exists within the list. And if it doesn't, then it adds it. And if it already exists, then it removes it. So yeah, these methods can access those properties regardless of whether they're private or public and you would probably just want to keep them public unless you're using some kind of method or something else that would utilize those properties. And just in case, if you are wondering any real world use cases for methods, can you see this add thingy right over here on the list? Yeah, that's a method because lists are originally a class that can be used as a data type which creates an object that contains a dynamically changing array and we typically set it equal to a new list constructor function. Anyways, that's the end of the video. I'll be releasing another video on what exactly happens when we call new, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.